بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم. We greet you from my sitting room here in the Caribbean island of Trinidad with Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And today's subject is a somber one. It's a difficult one. And uh, we have to take our time today uh, in addressing the subject of Ukraine once again because events are now unfolding increasingly dangerously. And uh, I owe a duty to my students and to the viewing audience in different parts of the world to update them and to give them my views based upon my understanding of the Quran and of the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad, Allah's blessing be upon him. I am conscious of the fact that there are many who are not Muslims who are also now viewing these videos, and so I have to try to translate whenever I use an Arabic term to translate it and explain it. Our topic is Ukraine, the just war. Just a bellum, the just war, and international law. And uh, the background for choosing this topic is that uh, uh, Russia has just announced a partial mobilization of troops, uh, about 300,000. And uh, that is a very clear indication of the clouds of war and I'm talking about the big war. Uh, we, since February, what we had was a Russian military intervention in, um, in Ukraine, and it was forced upon Russia. Uh, there was no alternative left for Russia. Russia did everything she could to try to avoid it, to resolve the problem. Not only was there a problem of oppression, and we have a lot to talk about that, oppression in those parts of Ukraine which did not accept the bogus coup d'etat that took place in 2014 uh, financed from abroad to, to overthrow a government in Ukraine which was friendly to Russia and to replace it with one which was monstrously um, hostile to Russia and uh, this was not acceptable to so many people in Ukraine who were Russian speaking for themselves. And they were considered themselves to be a part of Russia ancestor, ancestry. And uh, because these people refused to accept it and resisted that, revolu that coup d'etat in um, Ukraine in 2014, what Ukraine responded with was the same kind of oppression that you have in India and Kashmir. And so there was, uh, there was war in Ukraine going on between the government of Ukraine and those who resisted the change in government. And people were being killed, war was going on. And this went on for seven years, seven long years, until eventually Russia intervened to liberate these people from oppression. And we're going to have to deal with that subject today. I don't know how long it will take. But there was also another reason for Russia's intervention. And that is Ukraine was moving in the direction of joining the military alliance that was hostile to Russia, namely the North American Treaty Alliance, NATO, Treaty Organization, NATO. And Russia was warning and warning and warning, we will not allow this. This is an unacceptable security threat to Russia. And, uh, and so after all the warnings had been ignored by the Western world, and they said, no, no, Ukraine has a right to join uh, NATO and you can't stop it. And then eventually, when there was no other option, left Russia in order to save her own people, Russian people, Russian speaking people in Ukraine from oppression. It doesn't matter whether they're Russians or not. Any people who are being oppressed, Russia has the right, according to God's law, which is our topic today, according to God's law, to intervene, to liberate the oppressed. 
And Russia also has a right to ensure that her own security as a state was not threatened in such a, such a significant way. And so this is the reason why there was a military uh, intervention in February. And uh, six months have passed, it is, and now we find that the war, it's no longer an intervention, it's a war because Russia has now published that almost 6,000 of their soldiers have been killed in this war. So it is a war. Uh, we don't know what are the figures for Ukraine, but Russia has told us these are the numbers who have been killed. So you have a war in, in Ukraine, and uh, now the war is about to escalate. And that's what I want to explain to you before we proceed. And that is those parts of Ukraine which have been liberated from oppression. And I use my words carefully, liberated from oppression. They are now, as I speak, they are voting in referendums that these territories become a part of Russia. It's a foregone conclusion. These people have been suffering for seven years. And now they're getting a chance to be free from oppression. So obviously, they would want to have a security of being a part of Russia to ensure that they're never again a part of Ukraine. That's why they'll all vote to join that the territory become a part of Russia. When the, the referendums are completed in a few days' time, then the Russian parliament will have to decide whether or not to accept them and make them these territories a part of Russia. It matters not to the Russian people. It matters not at all to the Russian parliament whether the United States accepts or does not accept, whether Britain accepts or does not accept this uh, uh, joining Russia. That's irrelevant. That is totally irrelevant. These are not the people who rule the world. And they certainly, they certainly don't rule Russia. They don't rule China. They don't even rule India today. Hmm? They don't rule Iran. They don't rule Venezuela. They don't rule Korea. They don't rule so many other parts of the world anymore. And they would not understand it. The day of the universal policeman is coming to an end. So whether they accept or does not accept is irrelevant to the subject. What is relevant? is how Russia responds. And if Russia accepts these territories to be incorporated into the Federation of Russia, then they become a part of Russian territory. As soon as they become a part of Russian territory, the constitution of Russia gives to the government of Russia the obligation to protect every part of Russia. So once Ukraine now proceeds to continue the war against these territories, you're now waging war on Russia. And Russia has uh, announced that we are going to defend our land, defend our country by all means necessary. And so you have a road now leading almost certainly to nuclear war because Russia is not fighting the government of Ukraine alone. The entire Western world, you know, the modern Western civilization, my Islamic eschatology based on the Quran, led me to the conclusion long ago that modern Western civilization was created by the Antichrist, by Dajjal, the false messiah. Mm -hmm. And our prophet has described Dajjal the Antichrist. The Christians, of course, would be interested in this information. He said that the Jal has the word kafir written on his forehead. <laughs> and every believer, that is one who has faith in his heart. And those who say that a man can marry another man and get a marriage certificate, they don't have any faith in their heart. So he said that every believer would be able to read the word kafir and recognize, therefore, that modern Western civilization is a civilization based on kufr or, the, or blasphemy, the rejection of faith. And uh, he said, you'll be able to read the word kafir whether you are katib 
or gairu khati means whether you are literate or you are illiterate you still be able to read it so those who do not have internal insight they will not be able to recognize that they belong to a civilization created by the jal the antichrist and it is a civilization founded on kufr or the rejection of faith and the prophet went on to say about that the, uh, the people of kufr he says al kufru millatun wahida that all of these people who are in the religion the, the, the state of kufr they all constitute one community one political community millatun wahida so the russia is not fighting ukraine alone at all russia is fighting the whole of modern western civilization the power of modern western civilization is behind ukraine so this is a confrontation between russia and the rest of the of the rest of the west and um, as soon as the referendums are over as soon as the territories become a part of russia then if ukraine continues to attack these territories we're going to see a massive and a significant and an instantaneous escalation of the war in ukraine and this is a road leading clearly to nuclear war because russia has said we're going to defend our territory by any means necessary by all means necessary it is in this background that we now address the subject <laughs> i don't think that there is any possibility left for a peaceful resolution of the war in ukraine there are those who are still optimistic and i admire them for their optimism but my pragmatic view of the subject is that we've now passed the point of no return the um, the situation as it now exists is that russia has accepted that this war cannot be avoided the great war it's a confrontation with the west and the mobilization of troops in russia is an indication as plain as daylight that russia is now preparing for the great war that's right uh had it been possible for them to sit together and talk russia and ukraine yes russia and ukraine uh, as i think took place in february or march there was still a possibility that some peaceful resolution to the problem could be achieved but the western world did not want ukraine to agree to any peace terms with russia because they wanted russia to be defeated and now ukraine has announced very plainly and clearly we are not prepared to negotiate until we defeat russia on the battlefield so we don't want to solve this problem peacefully we want a military solution for the problem that is ukraine's position and therefore russia cannot be blamed now if there is no there are no negotiations possible to try to resolve the conflict the war uh, i have explained the russian side number one the threat to security number two the oppression of the people now look at the western world they are arguing and this is why the topic of this video is ukraine the just war and international law the western world is argue, arguing based on the united nations charter and based on international law that borders of states are sacrosanct that you can have no violation of the territorial integrity of a state that if you if if if, the, if russia has occupied parts of ukraine there can be no 
peaceful resolution of this war unless and until Russia withdraws her troops from Crimea and withdraws her troops from all those territories where the people were being oppressed for seven long years. Will Russia ever do that? It is time for us now to take a look at the subject from the perspective of truth in the Quran. When I was a student at the Graduate Institute of International Studies, and even before that, at the Institute of International Relations of the University of the West Indies, where, mashallah, I had wonderful teachers at the Institute of International Relations of the University of the West Indies. I have very fond memories of Professor Professor Dr. Leslie Manigat, who is the director of the Institute from Haiti and who had his PhD from the Sorbonne. I was delighted with that one year that I had at the, at the University of the West Indies. I couldn't find such teachers when I went to the Graduate Institute of International Studies in Geneva. But I had to study international law, not only here at the University of the West Indies, the Institute of International Relations, but I also had to do one year of international law at the Graduate Institute of International Studies in Geneva. I remember that my professor was a woman from Poland. And, uh, I, so, and so I therefore have some uh, introduction to international law. And what I found is that it is the same thing with international law as the, it is with political theory and economic theory that I studied. That mm -hmm. politics and economics and law as taught by the Western world are devoid of any moral foundation. There is no link between politics and morality, <laughs> between economics and morality, between law and the moral order. Uh, and there was a politician in Trinidad uh, whose name I will not mention, who famously declared, he says, politics has its own morality. <laughs> So, so, that's a very, very famous comment. Politics has its own morality. So, I was astonished in the classroom to see that the, the, it was devoid of the moral law in politics, in economics, and in international law. And so, when they say the territorial frontiers are sacrosanct, that you cannot occupy any part of a nation's territory at all through warfare. There can be no resolution to the problem unless you withdraw. That if you have a government who is behaving badly, then the way to deal with it is the way that a rat behaves. You know, a, a rat operates in the dark, so they will send the operators and they'll operate in the dark and they'll have a, have a color revolution as they did in Ukraine, um, as they did in, in Iran in 1952, in so many other parts of the world. And they will overthrow the government. That's right. And then they'll recognize the new government very quickly. But uh, the law with Allah is different, that you don't operate like a rat. You have to show integrity. You have to operate in accordance with the moral law. The law, the law of nations must conform with the moral law. And so today we want to look at whether or not, based on the Quran, whether or not Russia was justified in intervening militarily in Ukraine. What does the Quran say on the subject of a just war? What does the Quran say on the subject of the, the moral foundations of the conduct of state? I want to turn to Surah Tussad of the Quran. I'm going to give you the number of the verse as well. 
This is uh, Surah number 38. I normally don't do this, but this is so important a topic that I want to give you so you can check it out yourself. This is Surah to Saad, which is... The pirate is making a lot of noise. <laughs> um, uh, the pirate is very noisy. Surah to Saad is Surah number 38. And the verse is number 26. And Allah Most High speaks to David, Nabi Dawood Islam, who is the king and who is the prophet. And I have quoted this verse many, many times. And he says, Ba'adawuzu Billahi Shaitan Rajim. Ya Dawood, O David. Inna ja'alnaka khalifatan fil ard. We are hereby appointing you, establishing you as khalifa on earth. I'm going, going to come back to the word khalifa. Fakhkum bayna nasi bil haq. O Dawood, when we appoint you and establish you as khalifa on earth, you must establish governments, governance, sorry. You must establish your rule, you must establish your law on the basis of truth. So now we know Khalifa is one who establishes government, law, rule over a people. And it must be based on truth. And truth does not come from Washington. It doesn't come from the United Nations organization. It doesn't come from conferences. Truth comes from the one who created us all and who has us in his hand like this. Biyadihil mulk. Power and governments and rule and law is in his hand. Biyadihil mulk. So it is the Lord God. And from him comes truth and government must be based on truth. Law and rule must be based on truth. And uh, the, the Quran goes on to, to warn, Do not, you must refrain from deviating from truth by resorting to your own choices and your own views. Because if you do that, it will lead you astray from the path of Allah. Every politician should listen to this. Those who go astray from the path of Allah by following their own agenda, secular agenda, rather than the truth which will come from Allah those who rule over people there is suffering severe suffering in store for them because they've forgotten there's a day of reckoning this is surah to saad of the quran and so the truth which has come from allah is the highest law and international law must submit and be built on the foundations of the law which has come from Allah, which is part of truth. Then uh, we, the Quran shows us how this truth was applied when uh, the Israelite people uh, were faced with oppression in the Holy Land. The Holy Land was filled with oppressors. And uh, they had to fight to liberate that land. But those who were oppressing were very strong people, powerful forces. And once one of them was called Goliath, a mountain of a man. But Allah helped Dawood, David, Dawood, and he killed Goliath. And then the Israelite people were able to defeat that. Um, those oppressors and liberate the land 
And here is the verse of Surah to the Baqarah. And this is uh, the second Surah of the Quran. And the verse is 251. <laughs> Did, uh, by Allah's leave, the Israelites were able to defeat them. This is a just war against the Persian. And David killed Goliath. And the consequences of that victory was that Allah bestowed upon him and upon the Israelite people the, the ownership of that land, the territory, so they're able to establish their state. Atahullahu mulka wa hikmah and wisdom. And so the law which has come from Allah is if you have to wage a war to liberate the oppressed who are calling for help, and you defeat the oppressor, then that territory becomes yours. You have the right now to rule over that territory, take control over that territory. And uh, the international law which says that territory, territorial integrity is sacrosanct. That you cannot violate terri territorial borders through warfare is in direct conflict with Allah's law where Allah is saying that when you defeat an enemy who is oppressing the people then you have the right to, to occupy to take control of that territory is now yours I want to teach this subject to our people who may be brainwashed by all the propaganda coming from the western world about international law once it is a just war, the wars won, the wars which were waged by the Ottoman Empire for 600 years against the Orthodox Christian people were not just war, they were bogus wars. And they occupied the territory. That was oppression. The Ottoman Empire was therefore an oppressor. But that's not, bo that's not Islam, that's bogus Islam. The real Islam, the real Islam is that you only allow to fight in a just war. And it is most certainly a just war when you fight as the Israelites fought in the Holy Land to liberate a territory from oppression. This fatal defect in international law must be exposed. That, let me repeat it one more time because you're going to be hearing this over and over and over again from Washington, from London, from Paris, from all the universities, from all the specialists and so on, who base their views on the United Nations Charter, who base their views on international law, and who no care to peanuts for God's law. That's right. They're not a Christian people at all. <laughs> I think they're following Santa Claus, not Jesus. Hmm? But we who follow Muhammad Islam, we have to teach the world. We have to teach the world that the law which has come from the Lord God is quite different from international law. And so when you wage a war which is a just war and you're able to liberate a territory then that territory is your territory. We turn now to another verse of the Quran uh, which, in which Allah defines uh, a just war. Um, this is a verse of the Quran in which surah now it is in um, in uh, Surah An-Nisa Surah An-Nisa and this is a pivotally important verse of the Quran and our Christian viewers would be very interested in hearing what the Lord God has to say 
about the just war. He says in Surah to Nisa, that's Surah number four, and the verse is number seventy-five. Wama lakum, wama lakum, la tu qatilu na fi sabil Allah. والمستضعفين من الرجال والنساء والولدان الذين يقولون ربنا أخرجنا من هذه القرية الظالم أهلها وجعل لنا من لدنك وليا وجعل لنا من لدنك نصيرا. Remember Surah number four and its verse seventy five. And this is what I'm not giving a translation of the verse because the miraculous word of the Lord God cannot be translated. No, it cannot be translated. So what I'm offering you is an explanation of what is in the Quran. What's wrong with you? The Lord God is asking. Why don't you rise up and fight in the cause of the Lord God? In a just war, that is. Why? To liberate a people who are weak and helpless. They cannot, they don't have the strength to resist the oppressor. Like the people of Kashmir, they don't have the strength to liberate the oppressor. Like the people of Palestine, they don't have the strength to liberate themselves from the oppressor. Like the people of Donbass and losing the parts of Ukraine which were being oppressed but at least in the case of the Ukraine they wage war it was a difficult war they were able to survive for seven years so Allah is saying why don't you rise up and fight in the cause of Allah in that just war to liberate these people from oppression who are unable on their own to resist the oppressor and who are crying out, Our oh Lord God, liberate us from this land whose people are oppressors. That's Palestine, that's Kashmir, that's um, Donbass. People are oppressors and raise for us out of your grace those who can stand with us in oppression, in, in resistance and raise for us out of your grace those who can help us. So Russia has responded to precisely this verse of the Quran. Verse number, I gave it to you, verse number, four, uh, verse number 75 of Surah An-Nisa. What's wrong with you? Why don't you rise up and fight in the cause of Allah? in a just war, to liberate the weak, the helpless men, women, and children who are unable on their own to resist the oppressor and who are crying out, O oh, our Lord God, liberate us from this land. This is what Dumbas have been doing for seven years, crying out, liberated from this land whose people are oppressing us and raise for us out of your grace those who can stand with us in resistance and raise for us out of your grace those who can help us. And so a just war is a war which is waged in the name of the Lord God to liberate a people from oppression who themselves do not have the power, they are weak, they are helpless, to resist the oppressor. And when you do so, and you, you reach out to them to help them, and to liberate them from oppression, that is a war ordained by Allah Most High. It's important for me to explain this carefully, so that on Judgment Day, you can't say, I didn't know, if you're falling for the propaganda coming from the Western world. But the same, the same the Quran, the same Quran which um, spoke about the just war, it then went on to say
in a in Surah Al Hajj. This is not plainer language. It says, "Uzina lil-ladina yuqatiluna bi anhum zulimu, wa inna Allah ala nasrihim laqadir." Permission, divine permission, is now granted to those against whom war is being wrongfully waged, as was happening in Donbas for seven years. To resist that oppression, permission is now granted to you to wage that war. And verily, Allah has the power to help you in such a war which is the just war. So the war which is coming up now, which is escalating now to a very dangerous situation, is a war in which Allah will be on the side helping Russia who is liberating the oppressed from oppression. If you do not understand that, too late on Judgment Day, if you support the oppressor, rather than support the oppression. But um, mm. the Quran goes on to explain who are those who are oppressed and you have to go out, to, out, you have to wage war to liberate them. It goes on to say in the next verse, that was Surah Al Hajj, which is Surah number 22, take a note of it, and the verse is 39. Now look at the next verse, which is 40, which identifies the people you have to fight to liberate them. الَّذِينَ أُخْرِجُوا مِنْ دِيَارِهِمْ بِغَيْرِ حَقِّ إِلَّا يَقُولُ رَبُّنَا اللَّهِ وَلَوْلَا دَفُوا اللَّهِ النَّاسَ بَعْدَهُمْ بِبَعْدِ لَا هُدِّمَتْ سَوَامِهِ وَبِيعٌ وَصَدَوَاتٌ وَمَسَاجِدٌ يُسْكَرُ فِيهَا اسْمُ اللَّهِ كَثِيرًا وَلَيَنْشُرَنَّ اللَّهُ مَنْ يَنْشُرُهُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَكَوِيُّ الْعَزِيزِ They are those who have been driven out of their land, the place they live, their homes. As they were driven out of Kosovo, they have the right to return. As they were driven out of Western Armenia, when Western Armenia was taken over by the Ottoman Empire and the Armenians had to flee for their lives. These people who were driven out of their home, they have the right to return, to liberate their territory and come back to the land. This is the Quran. And Allah says, they are those who have been driven out of their homes against all right for no just cause other than because they have a different religious belief. But they believe in the Lord God, the one God. And if Allah, now listen, and if Allah had not enabled people to defend themselves against one another, that is to use war to intervene, to liberate the oppressed, people who are being oppressed for religious reasons, as has happened through the Ottoman Empire. All monasteries, churches, synagogues, and masajid. I do use the word mosque. I don't know where that word, which garbage bin the word mosque came out from. I go to Britain and I see a big sign, mosque. <laughs> I don't know which garbage bin that word came from. The word is masjid. Masjid, a place of sijjah, of prostration, masjid. And the plural of masjid is masajid. When a word is in the Quran, show respect for the Quran. If Allah had not enabled people to defend themselves against one another, all monasteries and churches and synagogues and, mas and masajid, in which Allah's name is abundantly mentioned and praised, so Allah's name is mentioned and praised in a church and in a cathedral and in a synagogue. They're not worshipping some other God, they're worshipping the Lord. This is what the Quran is saying. Allah's name is mentioned in the synagogue. Allah's name is mentioned in the synagogue. Allah's name is mentioned in the monastery, in the church. And you want to de debate with Allah? What nonsense. 
they would have been all destroyed today. That's why when the Ottoman Sultan conquered Constantinople with a bogus jihad in 1453, it was a manifest violation of the Quran that he should take Hagia Sophia and transforming it from a cathedral to a masjid. But our critics don't care to pin us for the Quran. The time has come for us to expose them. There are people who worship their race. They don't worship Allah, they worship their race. They don't care for the peanut for the Quran. They don't care two peanuts for the Quran. It is their opinion that prevails over the Quran. And today we will expose them. And so now the Quran is clearly, clearly, clearly giving the legal foundation from Allah's law to wage war, to wage a just war, to liberate the oppressed, particularly when they're being oppressed for religious reasons. And so now we turn to uh, that if Allah had not ordained that these wars be waged, just wars. If Allah had not done this, if Allah had not ordained that just war be La Fasadatil Ark, this is Surah uh, Bakara perhaps, that the whole earth would have been filled with fasad, oppression, corruption. And over here in this verse, Lahuddimas Sawami will be all these masajid, all these churches and synagogues and cathedrals would have been destroyed if we did not have just wars. And so the just war is ordained by Allah and the just war is waged in order to liberate the oppressed. What are the consequences if you wage a successful just war and you're able to liberate a territory as Russia has done in Donbass, as Russia has done in Crimea and in other parts of Ukraine where people were opposed to the regime change in, in uh, Kiev in, in 2014, where the Ru or government of, Ru of Ukraine was overthrown through a coup d'etat organized from the West, funded from the West, financed from the West, everything from the Western world, to bring about a change in government which a new government will be a hostile to Russia. And these people say, no, we're not prepared to accept that. We're not going to support that. And now you're going to wage war on them. And so Russia has now liberated these territories. What are the consequences of a successful just war? Well, we answered that question already. And that is that when Dawood al-Islam killed Goliath, David killed Goliath, and when the Israelites were able to liberate the Holy Land, Allah gave them the mulk. They had the right to occupy and take control of that territory. And so that's the consequences of a just war. We've already mentioned that there is an imperative for a just war. That is, you, you must wage a war in order to liberate the oppressed. If you don't, you'll have to answer on Judgment Day. Allah has made it obligatory on Muslims and Christians, all those who worship the one God, He made it obligatory on you to wage a just war in order to liberate the oppressed. And Russia is waging a just war. And I am proud that there are so many Muslims fighting in the Russian army. And if war is too weak, it's to come out in the Balkans, then we Muslims must also intervene in the Balkans to save those who are oppressed. And the Christians of, of the Balkans have been oppressed for 600 years by bogus Ottoman Jihad. Now then, the Quran goes on to tell us the rationale, which of course should be easy for people to understand. The rationale for the just war 
the rationale for um, uh, liberating the oppressed. The, the Quran reminds us that uh, Allah's purpose of sending mankind on earth, of establishing the Khalifa on earth, the Khilafa state on earth, of establishing power to be used to ensure that the oppressed are liberated. He says the reason for this is because Allah wants peace on earth. This is Surah to Yunus and it is the 10th Surah of the Quran and this is verse number 25. This is a pivotally important verse for the Islamic conception of international law. Wallahu yad'u ila daris salam wa yahdi man yasha'u ila siratim mustaqim. That Allah wants that peace should be established on earth. Darus salam is also there in Jannah. But Darus salam is here also on earth. And peace cannot be established without justice. And to oppress a people is injustice. That's what Modi is doing in Kashmir. And the Hindu people must wake up and understand that the religion of Hinduism does not accept oppression. The people, the Jewish people must understand that Judaism does not accept oppression. And that's what Israel is doing to the Palestinians. And this is what Ukraine has been doing in Donbass. So here is the verse. Wallahu yad'u ila daris salam wa yahdi man yasha ila siratim mustaqim and know that the Lord God invites mankind onto the world of peace and guides those who are willing to be guided onto the straight way and then finally the last verse of the Quran I want to share with you is that uh, the Quran <laughs> reminds us for those who have forgotten in the modern West that Musa alayhi salam announced to the Israelite people in al lillah the earth belongs to Allah if the earth belongs to Allah then it is Allah who decides how the law should be established to regulate affairs on the earth. They believe as though they own the earth, that they are the chosen people of the Lord God. They have come with a civilization which is dazzling the world with their scientific and technological revolution. They have, they have mountains of bread. All the wealth of the world is with them. And they have impoverished all the rest of mankind with riba the usury and they are the world's policemen and we must all submit to them and bow to them but they have forgotten that the earth does not belong to them the earth belongs to Allah inna al lillah and so we conclude now uh, with this uh, uh, talk on uh, Ukraine the just war and international law by giving you an analysis based on the Quran that Russia is waging a just war and we the world of Islam must support those who are waging a just war now then finally uh, a subject which we have spoken of so many times already in the past how should you prepare how should you prepare for the Great War? Uh, the Great War could take place next week. Yes, it can escalate rapidly. It may take another month, two months, three months, I don't know. But sensible people must prepare for it. Uh, how do we prepare? I am, in, I am preparing to travel in January, inshallah, for six months. Uh, at my age, um, I pray to Allah to help me to be able to travel and uh, 
So my wife asks me, what about if the war takes place while you're traveling? And my answer is whether I live or whether I die, it's in Allah's hands. I'm not bothered about where the war, when the war will take place and where I will be. I'm not hiding from the war. I'm not seeking to save myself. Uh, the, the parrot is annoyed. <laughs> um, so I'm not concerned about that. I'm not concerned about that. I'm going to travel. If I die, will I die? Allah is, uh, Allah is the one who, in whose hands is life and death. But you have a duty to your families. Yes, your wives, your children. And uh, when the great war takes place, many will die. But I believe that most of them will be in Europe, in North America, in uh, China, in Russia. And in places where there are military bases like, of course, Kosovo. Most people will die, many people. But many people will also survive the Great War. And it's for those who survived the Great War that we have been advising you again and again and again and again. That there will be no electricity. So if you are dependent on electricity, if you are dependent on gas to cook, how will you cook? And you need to cook to eat. Every day you have to cook. I am stocking up on wood. Yes. Yes. <laughs> this last one week, two weeks, I've been stocking up on wood. Uh, I'm, uh, at a chain store, we're cutting them two feet apart, two feet in length, to use wood for cooking. And I am building for the last two years, uh, struggling to build a small house in the remote countryside. And I have a fireplace outside where I can cook with wood. I'm preparing for this. I'm telling you this because I want you to prepare yourself as well. And you will not have water. Not only will there be no electricity, there will be no water in your, in your main lines, in your pi pipelines. So you have to get a place where you have access to water well. If the stream is still clean and all the rivers of the world today are now so dirty, you have to find a place because you can't live without water. You may store some water, but you don't know whether the containers that are used for storing the water will survive nuclear war. Um, plastic would melt probably, glass would break. Um, if you have a storage of some water, it only lasts for so long. So it's a well that you need, or if you have the means to desalinate seawater, to drinking water, uh, which is something I'm considering because the house I'm building is a hundred yards from the beach. Um, but that's an expensive uh, equipment to, to desalinate the salt water and get it into drinking water. You need food when the water takes place. What are you going to do? Are you going to sit down and do nothing until the war happens? No, no, you have to prepare for advance. A believer doesn't sit down and do nothing. A believer prepares for the future. I have spent many, many lectures explaining this for the last 10 years or more. And this is one more time. That you should live in the remote countryside. My students in Pakistan, I'm proud of them. That they have, they have bought land in the mountains of the north of Pakistan and there are several projects in Pakistan. I'm not going to give any information of location because the enemies will want to shut them down. So my students in Pakistan are doing that. There are lovely mountains in Pakistan with water. Once you have a mountain, you have water. And there are lovely mountains in Albania. Mashallah, I, I, Albania, a beautiful country with mountains. So you must go to the remote countryside. Don't stay in London. Don't stay in Birmingham. <laughs> Don't stay in Leicester. Your Maulana or your Mufti is only concerned about his bread and butter. Yeah, he's not advising you, but I am advising you. 
that get out, get out of the cities and look for security in the remote countryside. Build simple homes and uh, and uh, stock up on wood to cook and uh, make sure you have access to water and in the countryside you have people planting food you'll be able to get food to eat so i thank you all you've been patient with me today on ukraine the just war and international law wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh